Perhaps some of the more curious among you have been wondering where we were going to go now that we have finished our series in the book of First Thessalonians. I hope you've been wondering anyway. Uh, and the answer is that we are going to the book of Luke. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, the third Gospel. Now, our intention at this point in time is not to do a series all the way through the book of Luke, which would undoubtedly take us a few years. But we want to look at the first major division of Luke's Gospel, which uh, is Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 1, through Luke 9, verse 50. And we're going to be considering then, uh, especially the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to be one of the primary themes that is going to emerge uh, as we work our way through the book of Luke. And uh, so this morning, we're just going to be giving attention to uh, the introduction to Luke's gospel, which uh, if you compare gospel account to gospel account, is really quite a unique thing. Luke's uh, prologue, as it's often referred to, is quite unique. Uh, we don't have to guess at what the purpose of Luke's gospel is. He wants us to be very clear on that from the beginning. And just as a note uh, on, on the nature of, of the gospels and reading the gospels, uh, there is a tendency in our age, uh, in, in the present the, the modern era, if you want to call it that, there's, there's a tendency to read the Gospels with that kind of lens on. And, and so we have an attitude that says, give me the facts, just the facts, the facts are all that I need. But if we read the Gospels in that way, we're actually missing the Spirit's intention in using these four different men to pen four different Gospels. Gospels which all present and focus on the same person, the Lord Jesus, that all agree in their theology that the Lord Jesus was holy man and holy God, but they have different uh, uh, underlying purposes in writing. And, and so we want to pay careful attention to that as we read the Gospels. So we're going to consider Luke's intention in writing his Gospel this morning. Uh, so give attention then to the reading of God's Word as it comes to us from Luke chapter 1. We're just going to read the first four verses. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. There ends the reading of God's word, and may he add his blessing to it as we consider it this morning. There is a distinction between facts and the truth. Have you ever thought about that? We, as, as I already uh, implied, we live in a very fact-oriented world. And, and so we're always in pursuit of the facts. And uh, this, I, I hope, has special relevance for us in 2020. Because for the last four years, we've been hearing about fake news. <laughs> okay? And, and what we've learned is that uh, laying outright lie, lies to the side, uh, set, setting to the side the body of things that are actually not true in and of themselves at all, what we see is that facts by themselves don't tell us all that much. Facts have to be placed into a context. And the context into which we place facts will determine whether or not we are getting at the truth. 
And parents, you know this. How many times have you talked to your children seeking an account of some misdeed? And as your child stands there in front of you, they begin spinning for you a story that is vaguely recognizable as something approaching the truth. Because all of the basic features of that story, of, of what actually happened, are in place. But even uh, by things as subtle as vocal tone, uh, switching around the order of the facts, a child, a young person, can manipulate the truth of the story. But this isn't the realm of children alone, as if children were the only ones who did such things. We ourselves are inclined to do the same things at times, aren't we? When we retell a story, we give a particular tone of voice to the antagonist, and, and every once in a while, somebody calls us out and says, is that really how that was said? Well, no, maybe not. You see, by an act as simple as, uh, uh, as reordering, we can completely change the whole face of the truth. We can completely change what has happened because we are interpreters. That, uh, as a matter of fact, is part of the, the issue that's behind the massive corruption of science in our day. Because science is not simply factual. But behind the science, there's always a scientist who has a particular worldview, who wants to order facts in a particular way that makes sense in their worldview. So we have the same facts as those who claim that the world uh, evolved over billions and billions of years. We're in possession of the same data, in possession of the same rock layer evidence, the same fossils, etc., etc. And yet we come to vastly different conclusions because we're putting the facts into our worldview. We're using a lens, a particular set of glasses through which to observe them. You see, the truth is like a tapestry. And the facts are like individual threads woven to create that tapestry. Well, if you change the order of those threads, a different picture will emerge. And this is a helpful illustration for what Luke is doing in his gospel. Because Luke is concerned with more than just the facts surrounding the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke is concerned to communicate to Theophilus and to all those who will read his gospel the true identity of Jesus. And this was a hotly debated topic, wasn't it? Because after all, the disciples, the 12 uh, disciples that walked with Jesus, or we should say the 11, uh, discounting Judas from this picture, they saw the same things, they had the same facts, as did the Jewish leaders. But they came to very, very different conclusions about who Jesus was. One, seeing him as the Messiah, the Son of God, who had been sent to save his people from their sins. The other group, seeing him as undermining the Jewish nation, undermining God's purpose as they understood it. And so you see, we need more than just facts. We need facts that are arranged for us, facts that are interpreted for us, and that is what Luke gives us in his gospel. Now, briefly, let's, let's just give a kind of an introduction then to this gospel. First of all, thinking about the author, Luke himself. This gospel is attributed to, to Luke uh, as uh, we see by it being called by his name. However, uh, it doesn't ever, he doesn't ever identify himself. The writer doesn't ever identify himself throughout the course of the gospel. But the fact that it was a man named Luke, and quite likely uh, the doctor Luke that traveled with Paul at different points in his missionary journeys, the doctor Luke who was actually caring for Paul, at particular points in his life, is the very man that wrote this gospel. And uh, note in that connection that all, of, all four of our gospels then have apostolic 
tradition behind them, apostolic authority behind them. Two of them, uh, Matthew and John, being written by those who were in fact apostles of Jesus, and two of them, Mark and Luke, being written by those who received their tradition from an apostle. Mark writing uh, as Peter's understudy, and Luke writing as Paul's companion. And so uh, this gospel tradition uh, has a strong foundation to it. Well, as far as the identity of Luke, as far as who uh, he was in terms of being Jew or Gentile, that's not altogether clear. It seems quite likely that he was actually a, a Gentile man, but that he had long-standing familiarity with the Old Testament Scriptures, a fact which will become very clear as we work our way through the pages of this Gospel. And he wrote... Uh, sometime between the year 63 or so and 75. There's about a 12-year period in there where he wrote, uh, I'm inclined to go earlier, believing that uh, as Luke wrote, Paul was still alive. And, and uh, as many of you are aware, Luke also wrote the book of Acts. In fact, even though the book of John is between Luke and Acts, we really need to take Luke and Acts as a whole. Uh, Acts is the sequel of what Jesus began to do and teach, which is what is uh, related for us in Acts or in the book of Luke, rather. And uh, altogether, then, if you take Luke and Acts, that means that Luke authored the majority of the New Testament. Did you know that? Luke authored more of the New Testament even than Paul himself. Uh, Luke, uh, between the book of Luke and Acts, that makes up approximately one-third of the New Testament. So, uh, but what we want to consider now uh, in verses 1 through 4 is this idea of searching for certainty. Searching for certainty. Now, uh, Luke in, is uh, clearly certain in his own mind of the truth of what he writes. He is certain in his own mind of the identity of this Jesus, but he's writing to Theophilus, who is a, a catechumen, a student, one who has been uh, catechized in the Christian religion, uh, but, but is facing maybe some, uh, some unanswered questions. There are things that he's seeing around him that he's having a hard time making sense of. And so Paul, or Luke rather, writes to him to confirm for him the identity of Jesus. And what we see in these verses is that our faith in Jesus is well-founded because his life, death, and glorification, rightly understood, make clear his messianic identity. Our faith in Jesus is well-founded because his life and ministry, rightly understood, make clear his messianic identity. So consider, first of all, then, uh, the trustworthy information that Luke is communicating to Theophilus. Or you could write next to point one, Luke's sources. Where is Luke drawing from? He says in verse 1, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now, there have been a number of people who have taken Luke's opening statement as a derogatory comment. Uh, many have attempted to do this job. Many have attempted to record a, a life of Jesus. Many have attempted to give a, a clear account of what has happened recently among us, but their work's been meh, lacking in some way, so I've taken it in hand now, and I am going to set this right. But that's not what Luke is saying at all. Uh, Luke's, Luke's statement is simply, meant to communicate to Theophilus that Luke is not the first one writing these traditions down. 
This is actually uh, right out of the gate, so to speak, an affirmation of the historical nature of what Luke is writing, of the well-attested nature of the events that he is going to relate. Events, by the way, which Theophilus, as a catechumen, is undoubtedly familiar with. He's undoubtedly familiar with the life of Jesus. It's just trying to make sense out of the various pieces of that puzzle. Trying to see the whole picture. He's, he's looking for the tapestry, but he's in possession of a handful of threads. And so Luke says, well, there are many that have written. And, and notice the unity of of uh, the, the content, he says, many have undertaken to draw up an account. And the fact that this word is in the singular is important. Because he's saying ultimately, all of these who have been writing down these traditions, uh, these oral traditions, these stories, these recollections of Jesus' life and ministry, they are but one account. Though different voices, it's the same story. He says, there is this tradition. This tradition is attested to by many. And this tradition is faithful to what has been handed down. He says, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Undoubtedly a reference to the, the apostles to the disciples, to those who are actual players, characters in the story that is going to unfold or be unfolded for us. Well, those eyewitnesses have passed down this tradition. And these various accounts, they remain faithful to that one eyewitness tradition. And what could be more reliable than the eyewitness testimony of the disciples of Jesus. Those who knew him in his early life. Those who walked with him during his ministry upon this earth. Those who stood at the cross and watched perplexed as he was crucified. Those who were terrified by the empty tomb. Those who were, uh, couldn't make sense out of Jesus' reappearance three days later. Well, Luke, he says, these, all of us have, have stayed true to these stories, these traditions that have pass, been passed down. And he says, this is an account of what? Well, it is an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Notice that he doesn't say, this is an account of recent events. But he's already giving us a uh, a hint of the direction in which he's heading. These are things which have been fulfilled among us. Now what's required for something to be fulfilled? It, it requires a container, doesn't it? Uh, if, if something is to be fulfilled, that means that, that there has to be something there uh, to begin with. Namely, the, the prophecy of the Old Testament, all that to which the Old Testament was pointing and, and now Luke is saying the ministry of Jesus was such that it has, these things have been fulfilled among us. They've been laden down. They've been filled up among us. But also, by using the passive voice, they have been fulfilled. He's pointing Theophilus to God Himself. Who is it that has fulfilled these traditions or these, these events, these things? while he's implicitly bringing God into the picture. You cannot make sense out of the life of Jesus apart from the sovereign will of God. If, you're, if you are searching for the historical Jesus, which is what some have tried to do, and, and they take a scissors to the Gospels, and they, they cut this out, and they cut that out, and they say this, this simply is, you know, anything supernatural, well, that can't be true. And uh, for Jesus to say this, these types of things, that can't possibly be true. And so by the time they're done with their scissors, the, the Gospels are in shreds. 
that purely kind of humanistic approach where man be- becomes the, the uh, ultimate determination of what can and can't be true about the life of Jesus is not adequate. No, because these are the things that have been fulfilled among us. God is an essential part of this picture. God is an essential part of this story. And if you are going to rightly understand who Jesus is, there has to be an element of submission as you approach the Word of God. There has to be an understanding that God is moving. That God has a plan in these things. So much then for the trustworthy information or Luke's sources. Then secondly, consider Luke's method. We move from Luke's sources to Luke's method, which is careful investigation. He says, uh, verse 3, Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good good also to me to write an orderly account for you. So Luke says, now, I didn't, I didn't accept the tradition uncritically. I've checked. I've done my homework. You can imagine Luke following up with those who, are, who still remain, who walked and talked with Jesus. Some among Jesus' own family. Some among uh, Jesus' own disciples. And, and Luke... Uh, just confirming and and cross-checking the tradition that he has received with these primary sources, as we call them, in in university. He's not satisfied to, to simply accept what he said or what she said, but he wants to go back to the source of this information, back to the source of this tradition. He wants to hear the stories told firsthand. And so he says, Theophilus, you can rest sure Rest assured that I have carefully investigated everything that is contained in the following pages. And the Spirit says the same thing to those listening today. Maybe you you read the Gospel accounts and it just seems too fantastic to be true. After all, we live in an oddly anti-supernatural world and yet an oddly mystical world at the same time. Somehow, uh, ghosts and all sorts of, of unexplained phenomenon are accepted, but Jesus is dismissed out of hand because Jesus can't possibly have done the things that Jesus is said to have done. Jesus can't possibly have died and then been raised from the dead again. Well, Luke says, I've carefully investigated this. If you won't take the word of one, will you take the word of ten? Of a hundred? Of five hundred? What's your criteria? How many people do you need to attest to the tradition before you will believe it? Luke says this isn't a story that that somehow just arrived. This isn't some kind of a folktale that was circulating and, and I liked it, and I, I took it, I latched on to it, I drank the Kool-Aid. He says, no, I've talked, I've talked with the people who were there. They saw it. They heard the things that Jesus said. And, and, and they weren't somehow duped into some kind of a hallucination. But rather, they were perplexed because they themselves couldn't make sense out of the events. A fact which appears very openly as we proceed, that the disciples themselves many times did not understand what what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was telling them about himself. And it was only as they looked back, and it was only as the, the pieces of the puzzle, the threads of the tapestry began to come together, as they remembered the things that Jesus had said, that all of a sudden a very clear picture, an unmistakable truth, an unmistakable story that sat right over the top of the Old Testament emerged. And they understood the marvelous, unsearchable purpose of God. 
in Christ. Luke says, I've looked into all of this. But now, let's, let's look secondly at this, this uh, second aspect of the method. He's not just a reporter. He's not just the one at the scene gathering the facts. Uh, and give me the facts, just the facts. All The facts is all I want. Thank you. But he's, he, he actually has a method of putting these things together. He said, uh, says, end of verse 3, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you. Now, again, our minds say orderly account, okay. Well, he's, he's simply speaking in terms of chronological order. Uh, and, and so he wants to make sure that he has every uh, piece in its chronological place. But that's not what Luke is saying here. He's not saying that this is going to necessarily be the most chronological, uh, chronologically accurate report that's being given. It is an ordered report, but it's an ordered report that's not concerned as much with the timing of the events as it is uh, concerned with the interpretation of the events. You see, as Luke uh, works with the pieces, as he, he assembles the puzzle, it's not a, so much a beginning of the life of Jesus to the end of the life of Jesus, though we certainly have time markers, though Luke's uh, uh, birth narrative is certainly the most, uh, the fullest, of all of the gospel writers, which makes Luke always so precious to us. We have these wonderful birth stories. But Luke's order is concerned with interpretation. Luke is concerned to untangle the threads. He's concerned to take that handful of threads from Theophilus and to put each one in its place on the loom in order that this beautiful tapestry emerges so that Theophilus can understand not just who Jesus was as a man, not who, just who, uh, what Jesus said and what Jesus taught and what Je the miracles that Jesus did, and not what the way in which Jesus' life ended, but he wants to put every piece in its place so that this tapestry of the purpose of God, the eternal purpose of God, that purpose that had been prophesied from long ago from the, the earliest pages of the, New or of the Old Testament had been fulfilled. These are the things that have been fulfilled among us. Do you see Jesus, Theophilus? You see what he says here? You see what he does there? You see what happened to him over there? These aren't all separate pieces that are somehow disconnected from one another, but all of these pieces are woven together to give a clear understanding that this is the Messiah. This is the Deliverer that God has sent. And Luke's peculiar concern as the Gospel unfolds is not just to... to explain that Jesus is the Messiah of the Jewish nation. But that this is the one in whom the nations will be blessed. Jesus' genealogy doesn't go back to Abraham in Luke. Jesus' genealogy goes back to Adam. Back to God Himself. Son of Adam, Son of God. Theophilus, you need to see the eternal purpose of God fulfilled in Jesus. You need to see that He is the Messiah. That is the message of Luke's Gospel. That is the method that he has in mind to untangle these threads, to put them in their place so that the, the tapestry of God's purpose emerges. So then Luke's method is careful investigation. His uh, sources are based on trustworthy information and Luke's goal, ultimately, as we've already said, is accurate interpretation. Our third and final point, accurate interpretation. One of the blessings of being raised in a Reformed church is being catechized. Isn't it? Being taught. 
And so boys and girls, young people from the earliest of ages, at least if you've been at Pompton Plains in your earlier years, you have been systematically taught what the Bible teaches. But the great danger that faces us, historic faith, these are the facts about Jesus and Jesus' life to an, a complete resting in Jesus and resting on Jesus and looking to Jesus alone for deliverance. Theophilus maybe isn't that much different than, than uh, those of us who have been catechized. In fact, uh, the word he uses for taught, so the, uh, verse 4, so that you may know the th certainty of the things you have been taught, is actually the very word from which we get our word catechism. You've had these things drilled into you, Theophilus. It seems that Theophilus himself is, is some kind of a, an official in the Roman government. Uh, and, and that is why Luke addresses him as most excellent Theophilus. And yet, there is something about this way. There is something about the Christian faith that has attracted Theophilus. He's been undergoing instruction. He's received the, the, the different pieces, the facts about Jesus' life. And yet, he's doubting. And he, Why is he doubting? He's doubting, first of all, because... As the Gospel proceeds, a story which is so clearly manifest and, and told in the book of Acts, there is this continual tension between the Jewish way and the Christian way. Whereas the, the Christian way grew in the womb of the Jewish religion, it was expelled. Because as the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ goes forth into all the world with power. As the word is brought to synagogues, so many of the Jewish people reject it. So many of the Jewish people to their own hurt reject Jesus of Nazareth. So many have hardened their hearts against Him. And, and so one question that Theophilus may have is, if Jesus is the Messiah, why have the Jews rejected Him? And, and maybe more poignantly, driving more to the heart of Theophilus, if Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, the one that God had promised from long ago, then why do the Jews hate us Christians so much? Why is there this wall that has grown up between us? And then this question. Jesus spoke so much about the blessings of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven. But I look at the Christian way and I see that it's a way of affliction. Yes, wherever the gospel goes, remarkable things are happening. But wherever the gospel goes, there's this intense, fierce opposition so that those who are so-called blessed, those that are members, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, they suffer the most intense persecution. They suffer all kinds of afflictions. How is that blessed? And so, one of the things that Luke will unfold to Theophilus is the fact that the, the kingdom, while it is indeed phys a physical kingdom, is much more than a physical kingdom, that it is a spiritual kingdom, and that the blessings of the kingdom may not, and, and in many cases won't be realized in our lives upon this earth. But that, that does not take away from the blessedness of those who have believed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus one bit. You see, Theophilus has been catechized. But he has questions. He's been taught, but he's uncertain. And now Luke says, I am writing a gospel account that is concerned particularly with a right interpretation of the life of Jesus. Why? So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So that means then, 
boys and girls, young people, perhaps even those well into adulthood among our midst, those of you who have a historic faith but you don't really find that you're resting on, on Jesus, those of you who perhaps are gathering here from week to week more out of custom, out of habit, out of comfort, those of you who have a form of godliness but are lacking the power of it as Paul says, listen carefully. Listen carefully. Ask that God would reveal Himself as we work our way through this first part of Luke. Because if you're listening, if your eyes are opened by God, you will see that Jesus wasn't just a prophet. Jesus wasn't just another religious fanatic. Jesus wasn't just an ethical teacher. Jesus is the Son of Man, Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah, the one that God in His love has sent to deliver His people, both Jew and Gentile. Jesus is the one in whom the middle wall of partition has been broken down. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to the Father. It is only through Him that there is deliverance. To those of you who are suffering under the weight of the cross, to those of you who find yourselves counting the cost, but you're a little ways down the road already, and you're saying, something isn't adding up here. Because I really thought that, that trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and putting faith in Him, I thought that that was going to resolve my problems. But it's created more. I thought that Trusting in Jesus was going to remove the rocks from my way. That it was going to remove the pain and difficulty. But my life is harder than it's ever been. I'll take heart. Because what you will see is that while you may not always feel blessed as a Christian and in the Christian way, this is indeed the way of blessing. And all who have believed in Jesus are blessed. And there is something far better that is prepared for you. Take heart. May God give His grace then as we consider uh, this, uh, these chapters 1 through 9 together. May God give us to see more clearly Jesus as He is and not Jesus as our minds construct Him to be. And may it be, and, and I encourage you to pray this. Pray this for this series that God would make Himself clearer to each one of us. That He would give us a deep and abiding certainty in His person, in all that He has accomplished for us, so that we may be caused to rejoice. That's where the, uh, the Gospel of Luke ends. You know that? Why don't you flip forward to, to Luke 24? There's this note of uncertainty. You have Theophilus questioning at the beginning of the Gospel. And then the end of the Gospel. It's just beautiful. Verses 52 and 53 of chapter 24. Well, actually, let's back up and grab 51 as well. While he was blessing them, that is Jesus, his hands lifted up, blessing his disciples. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. My dear friends, this series through Luke, blessed by God, will bring us there. We will find a renewal of joy and it will be joy in the certainty of all that Jesus is to us and all that Jesus has done for us. May God grant it to be so. Let's pray.
O Lord, our God, we thank You for Your Word. Your Word is truth. And we ask, Lord, that You would teach us from Your Word, uh, that You would teach us not only to treasure Your Word uh, and to be careful students of Your Word, but also that You would continue to confirm our faith, that You would continue to affirm to us who Jesus is and all that You have done for us in Jesus. And we ask, O Lord, our God, that You would use this uh, series of studies in the book of Luke to strengthen our faith and to cause our joy to abound and overflow to your glory. Amen.